Hi, I'm Kurt Mitchell and welcome to the Van Halen Guitar Method. Before we get started talking about Eddie and all of his equipment and all the stuff we're going to cover, I want to tune up and get that out of the way. Um, I'm tuned to half a step down. Most of the stuff that he's done throughout the career of Van Halen is half a step down, okay? So um, if you want to tune to your tuner, tune your whole guitar half a step down, that's going to probably be easier than what we're about to do. What I'm going to do is give you an A or a fifth string, open fifth string, I want you to tune your guitar to my A. I'll give you enough of it so that you can, you can come back and keep checking it after you tune the rest of your guitar. Tune to my A, tune the rest of your guitar, come check it again, and we'll be in tune throughout the lesson, okay? Let's get started. I'll give you an A. Here we go. What we're going to do on this tape, we're not going to concentrate on songs so much as the technique that Eddie used to play, uh, the, that he uses to, in his approach to his playing. We're going to talk about uh, the gear, um, starting with the very first record and on through uh, for unlawful car carnal knowledge. Um, we'll talk about the stomp boxes and his rack effects and all this other stuff. Uh, Oh, we're, let's begin with the guitars. In seven, back in 77, 78, which is, I mean, quite a while ago, um, 12, 13 years ago, what he was doing was he was playing a Les Paul for a fat sound, but he didn't like the way it felt, right? So he started playing a Strat, but nobody liked the thin sound of the Strat. So he took the humbucking pickup out of the Les Paul, put it in a Stratocaster, and it's become the day's standard rock guitar. And basically, this is what you have. He had a um, Strat-style guitar with one pickup in it, one volume knob, and that's it. He had a tremolo that wasn't a Floyd Rose clamp. It was an ordinary Strat uh, bar. And he used to, I believe, he used to oil the nut so that the strings would slip back and forth and the guitar wouldn't go out of tune, um, enabling him to use that bar. Because once you play a Strat, if you've ever had a, played a clamped guitar and then played a non-clamped guitar, you can understand what I'm saying. As soon as you touch the bar on a Strat without a clamp, it goes out of tune. Um, the fact that the, the Floyd Rose clamp came out just afforded him more flexibility because you can't knock one out of tune once you've got the strings stretched out. Um, let's talk about the pedals he used to use. He was using, um, on the first record now, uh, and through like the first two or three records, he's using a pedal board that had a bunch of stomp boxes plugged up to it. He had a phase shifter, an MXR phase shifter, an MXR flanger. Uh, I've heard that, he's had, uh, that he had a pedal EQ. He had two tape delays, two what they call echoplexes, and he had one Univox tape delay. So he had three delays and he had little buttons that would turn them on and off in his signal. Um, and that's about it. You know, he didn't, there was not, they were duct taped to a piece of wood. And people laugh, I, I mean, I remember the first article I read of them, people are laughing at him, you know, because he's got this, this duct tape pedal board on the floor. It's good. It looked like junk. And then he, of course, he plugged in and it was over. But, uh, this is much what I got dialed up right now is much like the first album sound. We'll run through some of the effects a bit. Oh, let's talk about the amp first. The amp that he was using back then, and it, it's, it's gone through, he's, most, he's used a Marshall head for, through most of his career. Until the last album, I believe, he's used a Marshall head. Now he's using either Soldanos or 5150s or a combination of the two. I'm not quite sure anymore what he's using, but I believe there, I believe from the last article I read he was using 5150s, his own amp, which is sort of a Saldano um, with a little bit, with a resonance knob on it, what they call resonance. And anyways, but until then he was used playing an old Marshall head. Um, I've got one that's very similar to it. Uh, I got a 69 Plexi sitting here. When they say Plexi, they're talking about the plastic on it, right? Let's take a look at it and I'll show it to you. This is the same type of Marshall head that Eddie was using uh, back then and I'm sure he still has. Um, it's a 69 super lead and plexi. Plexi, only mean, plexi just simply means that there's a piece of plastic here. This gold stuff is plastic instead of anodized aluminum like the one on the top. Um, they're, they're collector's items now and they have a unique sound to them. All the older amps have a unique sound to them in that they, um, they have a trans, they hand wired the transformers and all of them were different and so every amp has its own characteristics. He had a guy named Jose uh, modify his amps so that they were cascaded so he could get some more gain out of them, and then he used a voltage regulator or a variac to run the voltage from 110, 120 is what you get out of the wall, up to like 140 or 50 volts for that first album, and uh, had it modified so that the tubes wouldn't, or the tubes would melt because the fuse wouldn't blow. So I mean, he was he was actually taking some chances with his amp, but anyways, um, 
let's get, let's get on with it and check out some sounds now, okay? Oh, by the way, I want to show you where we're miking the cabinet. This cabinet is simply for, uh, for us to have marshals in the set. We have our cabinet in an ISO booth, and it is ripping loud. Um, and so we have it sealed up, and I don't want to go in there and mess with that. But uh, I want to use this cabinet to show you where I'm putting the mic. There's only one microphone on this sound. A lot of people mess with mics, and they throw them around the room, blah, 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 this and that. Um, one microphone on old Celestian speakers. Um, they make reissues of the old Celestians now, which sound like the old ones, which is a good thing because the new ones are a little bit too bitey. 70 watts are too bitey. 30 watt Celestians. Let me show you where we're putting the mic. Here's a speaker. We put, we put a, we've circled it here for you. What we're doing is we're taking a Shure 57, SM57, Beta 57, which is a, with the, st the standard for miking guitar amps, um, and we're moving it off center, not dead center, but off to the right a little bit. And sometimes people angle them so that they're at an angle. I usually just put it straight on um, and put it right up against the grill cloth so I can get as close to sound as I can. Uh, so basically, this is the sound we got. Now, I have some reverb. Uh, I have a reverb that has a delay on one side and a reverb on the other. On the first record, there was a lot of reverb effects on the guitar. And it's what it made it sound so huge and live. Um, so in subsequent albums, he's backed away from that, and his sound's a little bit closer and a lot more studio sounding. Um, it had a lot more, the first album had a lot more treble on it, too. And so there's our basic sound. Now, what he used to do when he was playing solos, he would go to his phase shifter for like a treble boost. Well, what I actually started doing though is sweeping and it would take the, the tone and modulate it very slowly. Take the little phase shifter and turn the knob all the way down so the speed goes as slow as it'll go. And it's, it used to sound something like this. So you can see how the phase shifter played an integral part in um, the sounds that were gotten on the first album. And he was simply using it, I believe, to give himself a little bit of a treble boost for solos. Ended up being one of the coolest sounds you ever heard. Um, from here, what we're going to do is we're going to start looking at examples. Uh, we'll go chronologically in order from the first album to the, to, to the latest one that they've put out, which is for Unlawful Carnal Knowledge. And uh, we'll change the sounds and talk about the sounds, and we're going to talk about the riffs and his techniques right now, uh, along with the sounds. So when I start changing sounds to meet the needs of the, uh, of the albums as they go by, I'll tell you what we're doing with them, OK? Let's look at example number one. Well, I switched to a Les Paul, because I want to show you the, the uh, opening riff to Run With The Devil. Um, it's, it's, it's sort of a trick he's using. It's not really a trick, it's just a sound. And all he's doing is, he, see, he play, when I was expounding about the Stratocaster, um, he also played, I, I've, I've read it both ways. It was either an Ibanez Destroyer or it was a Les Paul, and I've seen him in concert with a Les Paul before. Um, so it could be either one, and as long as you have this bridge thing hit down here, you are able to do that. Cool sound, huh? But um, uh, he used that guitar. You can tell when he's using that guitar. There's no vibrato arm in the whole tune. Uh, he uses it on You Really Got Me. It's got the switch thing on it. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if he uses it anymore on the rest of the record. I, I, I just can't remember. But um, so he did use two different guitars, the one with the bar and one without. And I believe it was a Les Paul. I'm not sure. Um, anyways, let's move on to example two. What we're doing there is we got the, on Les Paul, there's the, a volume knob for each pickup. This one controls the neck pickup, and this one controls the bridge pickup. So you leave the bridge pickup knob on, so this pickup's on, you turn this pickup off. Then you have a pickup selector, and what happens is you cut it off. You end up cutting the sound, chopping the sound into pieces. Um, I don't know that he did that anymore. I think that's the only time he ever did that uh, on that first record. I mean, he got bored with things real fast and keeps trying to experiment, so. So, that, so as to not get stale. Um, let, me, let me put this guitar down. I'm going to pick my strap back up, and I'll show you a couple of excerpts from uh, Eruption that, uh, that will give you some insight as to, as to what he was doing way before anybody else really had a grip on it, OK? 
Um, example three, we're going to take a piece of uh, a couple of pieces of eruption here and explore. Pretty much eruption is Van Halen wrapped up in a ball. He used almost all everything that he knew on that one little piece of music. Um, what we're going to do right now is I'm going to show you something that he did. He did a lot that took me a long time to figure out because it sounds so wild. It just sounds like sounds like notes are going all over the place. What he does is he pulls off to open strings. He sort of string skips and pulls off to open strings. This is one example. This is a this is going to combine uh, the speed picking thing that he does and pull off to open strings. Okay, and and, and a trill at the end of it. It sounds like this. Slower. Um, let me show you one more thing off of, uh, uh, well, I'll show you a couple more things off this album because this one's full of good stuff. Um, we'll talk about some harmonics and stuff in a second. This is what's known as right-handed hammer-ons. A lot of people call them tapping. It's not tapping. I'll show you some tapping in a second. Um, pretty much, Billy Gibbons had done this before, Eddie, uh, with just this riff, right? Um, but nobody paid much attention to it. When Eddie came out and he fiddled with it and fiddled with it and all of a sudden he came up with this thing that he was doing, which is simply tapping like this with your fingers holding three different notes. This is the very end of Eruption. Um, I'm going to show you how with the pedal to do the bar dive at the end, okay? It's not a bar dive. It's a delay comes on after you hit the notes. Then you turn your guitar volume off and the delay takes over the note. You grab the speed knob, how fast the delay goes, and you, and you turn it down. Now, also involved in this is the fact that you have to have your phase shifter after your delay pedal. Okay? Let's check out example number four. Let's do it a little bit slower and uh, then we'll talk about the effect, okay? So the thing is with that delay, what makes it so cool, I mean, I swear, I thought that was a bar for years and years and years. I thought he was doing that with a bar. My guitar wouldn't go down far enough, and I made all these adjustments to try to get my bar to do this stuff. And then when I really, really paid attention, found out it was a delay. Anyways, um, let's go on to some other examples. We'll go into some harmonics of like on fire and stuff, and I'll show you some of the other tricks he's doing on this album. Then we're going to move on to the next album, change sounds correspondingly, and check out the cool things on it, and we're going to proceed in that method, okay? Let's go to example number five. That's, um, that's, his, that's a, a, one example of his use of harmonics on this record. Um, let me show you to you a little bit slower, OK? Here's riff six. One more time. Here's riff seven. One more time. Here's number eight. Once again. Here's riff number nine. He uses this in a couple of spots on, uh, on this record. He uses the same riff in a couple of songs. Here's number nine. One more time. Here's a little 
little pick slide, but not in the normal sense of the word. Um, this is a little trick he does where he does a trill and then he slides his pick around. Cool sound. It's a great sound. Check it out. Here's one that involves some finger stretching. He's playing in two positions um, and just using a sort of a riff and running and going straight down the strings, which he did a lot of. He was very, he's very clever at uh, figuring out ways to make cool sounds and, and do, do cool things, and, but doing them simply so that they're fast and they sound cool. This is number 11. This is, uh, this is a good one. Like, check this out. Slower. Uh, number 12, I want to show you uh, something that he did with this phase shifter um, that I always thought was some sort of mean, flanging, weird, bizarre thing. And all this is a little phase shifter in the delay pedal. And the delay pedal is hooked up for a very, very fast slap back. Okay, let's check it out. It's number 12. Here's the last one from this record. Um, we're going to move on and change our sounds, start talking about the other, some of the other things that he's done. Uh, this is number 13. Slower. On the second album, Van Halen 2, uh, we're going to explore a couple riffs, and mainly the tone has changed considerably. Uh, this is where he got to put, it seems to me, this is where he got to put his two cents in on about what he liked as a sound. I've heard demos of Van Halen stuff with the double guitars and all kinds of stuff, and what he seemed to like was what he coined the phrase, he coined the phrase brown sound, brown. He doesn't like a lot of treble on it, he likes it to be warm and mushy kind of, but t all at the same time tight. Um, as back, back in this era anyways, this is like 79. Um, and from this album on, he never got back to the first record sound, ever. So uh, this is the sound that I think he probably likes, because by then he was a star and he could pretty much tell him what he wanted to sound like. Um, this album is played a lot differently. He's, he do, he's not as fast and fluid and slippery anymore. He's more eddy, you know what I'm saying? That first album just seems to me like a lot of things came together to make that record different than all of the rest of them by a long, long shot. Um, let's check out the sound. We're going to come look at a, a little bit of the gear that we're using here to, so I can show you what's happened. Number one, the main thing that I've done right now is I've turned this amp up considerably louder and now the power tubes are what are making the distortion, whereas in the last record uh, you could, it was a buzzier tone while the, the amp was up loud the tone was buzzier. In order to get a power amp distortion to, cut, to, to occur, you need to crank up the amplifier. So let's take a look at the levels. We'll take a look at, uh, I got a couple other pieces of gear I've inserted in here, and we'll take a look at those. Let's do that now. Yeah, the treble here is, uh, is cranked up to about nine now, and, so, and the presence I backed off of so I could get a blend between the presence and the treble on Marshall's bass all the way up, middle all the way up. Uh, distortion, this is modified, understand. Uh, on his head, volume one and two would have, been the, would have been the distortion and he would have had another knob on the back to turn the overall volume up and down. Um, so my distortion's up. This is going to be different from amp to amp. My distortion's up quite, not quite so far anymore. I backed the distortion off too. But, and uh, it's louder, way louder. This rack's got four pieces of gear in it. Uh, the, I'm using the bottom three. The top one's a parametric EQ. The second one down is a noise gate compressor and the bottom one is a reverb. <laughs> Now, I don't want to go into uh, uh, a seminar and recording. Um, I just want to tell you briefly what's up. I've inserted the parametric EQ between the microphone and the fader so that it's not in line with the microphone and it gives you a lot more flexibility. Um, and it gives, you're able to dial in the little things. See, every time you go into a studio, everything's always different. So every record they make, the mics are different, the rooms are different, the EQs are different. Everything is always different. So these sounds evolved and changed through, the, through uh, 
throughout the years. And this, is, this little parametric EQ is, gives me the flexibility to be able to try to dial these sounds in for you. Let's take a look at one other piece of gear and we'll get on with the riffs in, on this album, okay? This piece of gear is called an Eventide Harmonizer. This is the real cool model with all the updates and all that. What I'm really using it for on this is to uh, give me a high quality chorusing effect because when he put something on that he liked to call JAPE, I don't know, there's another term he coined, uh, brown sound JAPE. JAPE is, JAPE is some effect on your guitar. Uh, when he started wanting to hear effects on his guitar, they started using digital delays to chorus them, which means they set the time off and then modulate it a little bit. And this thing does, on top of a thousand other things, it does that real well. So I'm using that for the chorusing on this, uh, on this sound. And from now on, most of the time, he's got a chorus on his guitar. Okay, let's get to the riffs. Here's riff number 14. <laughs> What he's doing there is he's gently setting his, I do it with the palm of my hand, he does it with his thumb. You gently set your thumb or the palm of your hand on there, on the string, and slide it down. You're going to achieve a bunch of harmonics. You're going to get all of them on the way down. The thing is, you don't want to push too hard or you mute the string. So you want to get it, uh, you want to get it, just touch, touch it lightly. Let's do the riff a little slower, okay? Here's number 15. What's going to be involved here is we're going to use our volume to fade notes in, okay? Riff number 15. Once again. Riff number 16. One more time. Seventeen. One more time. Here's number eighteen. One more time. The next thing Eddie brought to us is something that's called tapping. If you tap on the string 12 frets away from wherever you're fretting, you get a sound that sounds like this. Um, that's tapping. Everybody calls the, 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 uh, the, the two-handed hammer on stuff. Everybody calls that tapping. That's not tapping. Those are right-handed hammer-ons. This is tapping. Um, let me give you a couple of examples of tapping uh, on this second record. It's the first time we any of us ever heard this, and it's a darn good thing, and we thank Eddie for it. Let's have it, shall we? Here's number 19. One more time. This is number 20. One more time. For example 21, we've got a clean sound. I went to another amplifier, uh, went, into the, went into the clean channel, it's still a Marshall, 100 watt Marshall. Um, I got a delay going into the amp, so the same delay I used for the dive bomb thing on the eruption, I'm still using. And then I've got some chorusing, some good chorusing being printed with the eventide. Okay? And it's uh, The delay is this long. This goes like this. It's number 21.
On the third album, Women and Children First, there's a song on there called Cradle Will Rock. And uh, I always thought to myself, my God, how's he getting that sound out of a guitar, man? It's unbelievable. And you'll notice we got a keyboard over here. I don't want to teach you how to play keyboards. I just want to show you something. Eddie is a just a total innovator. The guy's always thinking. He's always trying something new. If it doesn't work, oh well. But he's always patching in stuff. And someone who said he knew him, he always had toggle switches in his pockets and stuff. Um, he started playing keyboards on Women and Children first, and everybody that buried it, David Lee Roth didn't want him to play keyboards, I don't think. I don't think he ever did. Ever wanted him to play keyboards, which is stupid, because, because Eddie plays them well, and he writes good songs on them. And he, I believe they both, the Van Halen, started out playing piano. Um, let me show you this, and you're going to see what I'm saying. I don't have the right thing. He had a Wurlitzer piano playing through his marshals on uh, the Cradle Will Rock. Let me show you this. The next thing we're going to talk about is, uh, well, we're going to move on from women and children first uh, on to fair warning. Um, I just wanted to, to lay that on you and know that, know that way before uh, 1984, Eddie was playing keyboards. Anyways, um, let's go to, I'm going to play you a little excerpt of some ridiculous hammering here. He started, he started hitting harmonics on different frets, like you can hit harmonics, say, at the 12th fret. Well, he started tapping them because he's a maniac. He starts tapping them and, and it starts to sound like this. Check this piece out. One of the other things that Eddie does infrequently, he doesn't do it a lot, is he'll detune. In other words, he takes his E string and tunes it down a step down to D. Uh, comes out sounding like that. Big, huge, big sound. Then he'll step on his flanger. He periodically steps on his toys to give it this sweeping sound and just a piece of the song. It sounds something like this. Check this out. Here's number 26. This is a finger pluck thing. Um, I want to show you a piece now where Eddie's taking a, a, a delay pedal, a volume knob, uh, and either a very heavy chorus or a, or a little bit of a flange, because a flange is a very extreme effect and a chorus is usually a pretty subtle one. So I've got a very subtle flange going and, uh, and he might be using a real heavy chorus, but they're plugged straight into the amp. These aren't coming out of the board. Um, uh, it's, these are, so this is going to be hammered volume swells uh, with some delay on it. The delay's about, about like that, okay? So here we go. Once again. Let's move the album 1984. Um, on Diver Down in 1984, Diver Down wasn't a very successful record. They had a lot of copy tunes on it. 1984, on the other hand, was they talked about for a whole year that Eddie was going to be playing keyboards on this record. So they hyped the heck out of this album. And uh, unbeknownst to everybody, he'd been playing keyboards for like three or four years before that. But 
He always disguised it with a Marshall. Dancing in the Streets has a keyboard part on the left-hand side if you ever want to check it out. It's not a guitar. The one that's making all the weird noises is a keyboard through, through a Marshall. At least that's what it sounds like. It's not a guitar. Anyways, um, so this album, uh, the Diver Down album, 1984, the, the guitar sounds got thinner in that they took, he took some of the low end away and, uh, and took some, he keeps backing the distortion off through some of these albums and then, but finally by unlawful carnal knowledge, the distortion gets cranked way back up, but they're not Marshalls anymore. So anyways, um, a lot of chorusing on these sounds now. I want to show you this riff uh, where he sort of fades, he does this pull off thing, mute thing, and then he fades into these harmonics. This is example 28. Let's check it out. One more time. Number 30. Once again. Here's number 31. Slower. Um, I'm going to show you an example right now of this speed picking thing he does. I can't hold my hand the way he does when he does it. He turns his hand around like this and sort of picks up underneath it. And it's a really strange, strange thing um, that I never bother. I mean, he's, he does it. Why bother? You know what I'm saying? Because um, my picking hand's a different thing. Um, but he picks real fast. Nevertheless, make it comfortable for yourself. And he picks real fast all the time. He does this on every record. He picks real fast and runs these lines up the neck. Check this one out. 32. One more time. Here's number 33. Here's number 34. Again. Thirty-five. Again. As we moved to 5150, he picked up a new toy, which was a Steinberger guitar. It has this thing called a trans trim on it, and it's cammed such a, in such a way so as when you bend the bar down, you can bend it down and lock it in, and it will play in certain keys because the strings drop at a certain rate, and they were able to scientifically work it out to where you could lock it in place and play in other keys. So he really used this thing a lot. I don't have one right now, but I, what I can do for you is I can show you some of the some of the things he was doing with the bar. He got very bar happy uh, for a while here. He was, his style has evolved into this sort of a loose type of a thing where he's using his bar all the time, playing as strangely as he can, it sounds like to me. Um, this, let's check a riff out here, okay? Let's look at this riff. Number 36. Again. Thirty-seven. Again. Again.
Here's number 39. Once again. On this album, OU812, we're going to shift albums here. Uh, he progressed into the Steinberger thing and it got very wet and muddy and strange sounding and had this big stereo separation from something like the Eventide Harmonizer we're using. And then on OU812, he sort of went back to a, like a fair warning sound, which was a very martially, very martially sound and the Stratocaster and the whole bit with the humbucking pickup. Uh, and on the very next record, we're going to get to Unlawful. Um, he completely changes everything, his guitar, his amps, the whole bit. It's a thoroughly different sound. Anyways, let's take an excerpt here. Uh, this is number 40. <laughs> One more time. On Van Halen's latest album, as of the making of this tape, uh, for Unlawful, he's got a completely different sound. Um, I've heard a bunch of stories, people talk about him. I was down at a convention down in LA for the music industry, and they were talking, Saldana was talking about how he stole their circuit for the 5150 and blah, 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 and on and on. What it sounds to me like is, is like a Saldano style amp, okay? Um, with the gain just jacked. He's got a ton of gain going. He switched guitars. He's making the music. He's doing the Music Man guitar thing now. Um, total different sound. It's very low end heavy. And it's extremely buzzy and distorted. Uh, and he's taken a lot of the mids out. It's it's non distinct. It's hard to put put your finger on. I mean, it still sounds like Eddie because it's Eddie playing the guitar. Um, but it's a much, much different sound. Um, I'm using a distortion pedal to get this thing to run like this. Let me give you example number 44. One more time. Eddie's uh, got a new trick on this album, or a new effect, and one that he's never used in all the albums that they've made, a wah-wah pedal. I mean, he's never at least recorded one that I know of. We got a wah-wah pedal here, and let me give you, uh, this is uh, example number 45, all right? Here's 46. Again. Um, the way Eddie approaches his courting, let me, let's talk about the way he approaches his courting in his songwriting. He's usually writing in a major mode. Um, which makes everything seem kind of happy, especially after the first two records. Everything got very happy. They're just happy guys. How could you not be? Um, his chords usually center around uh, major, the, the, this inversion of the first inversion of major chords and uh, these little bar chords. And then he like puts his 
And then he uses these. He's written a lot of hit songs with that kind of stuff, you know? All the time, Eddie's just using those all the time. And he's always inventive with his chords, but most of the time he's in a major mode, um, as opposed to minor, which mo most rock music is in. His soloing is comprised of blues riffs, entirely of blues riffs, except for the hammer-ons, which he was the first to put on record with some logic to it, therefore giving him the title of the guy who invented it. I'm not sure he invented it, but he certainly did come out with it in a big way. So, um, Other than that, he's usually using uh, a minor blues mode, which is in E, in e minor. Then he just loses his mind with his bar. And I mean, he's, of all the inventiveness he's come up with, he's very stuck to what, the, to what it is that he does. Um, so you got major chords most of the time. You have blues, minor scale, almost invariably, which is, seems strange going against a major mode. But the thing is, is a blues minor scale is the third flexible. It's, so you can you have that flexibility between the thirds. Um, let's go to example number. What number are we on? Forty-seven. Let's go to forty-seven. And check this out. Here's number forty-seven. These are, exam these are examples of three chords that he uses most often. Now you can move these chords. You can do a lot of things with these chords. You can play them straight out. You can move them around. You can pluck them. You can, uh, what else does he do with them? My gosh, he moves them all over the neck. I mean, he's always, he's always moving them all over the place, but basically those types of chords. He also he arpeggiates them too. He's always tap. He's tapping them. We we looked at an example of tapping earlier. Um, so, but basically, that those are the kinds of chords he uses. Um, let's go to example 48 now and I'll show you a little bit more in depth what uh, what he's doing with the the usual position that he uses the blues minor scale okay I'm gonna give you the blues minor scale I'm gonna play it all the way up the neck then I'm gonna give you a riff in it and I'm gonna shift it around to three different positions on the neck so you can see how to move your hand with the same fingering here we go this is in E minor now here's a riff This is the same scale played in B. In other words, you shifted your hand position down approximately. Let me see how far. Five frets, uh, five, six frets. Six frets in B minor. Here we go. Here's a riff for you. Example 50 is going to illustrate the same scale, same fingering, same picking, same kind of riff in A, which is uh, two steps, two frets down from the, the, uh, the last one that we did. Okay? Let me show you the uh, scale first. Here we go. Here's a riff. Well, that about wraps it up for this tape. Um, let me go over some of the, a couple of the things that, we, that we've, uh, let me review some of the things we've touched upon here. When he's writing songs, he's usually in a major mode. Um, when he's playing solos, he's usually playing in a, in a minor, a blues minor. He likes, to, he likes to pinch harmonics a lot when he's playing solos. 
always using open string, pull off to open string. Always doing that, always doing that. Right handed technique all the time. Bar, bar dives. One thing we never covered, uh, his pick slides were the best. On the first record, best pick slides I've ever heard. You can't just go ripping at them because they sound like this. You have to do a pick slide correctly and it comes out like this. Usually has that slide tagged onto it. Uh, when you want to play the bar thing, when you want to do that bar dive, the best way to do it is to whip your hand up the neck, pull the string off, and then dive it. So it comes out like this. Okay. Um, a lot of right-handed technique with Eddie and the harmonic thing. You can tap those harmonics out wherever you want, and you can you find them all over the place. Um, what else does a guy do? Oh, he's uh, the best at his effects. He, I never heard anybody use a pedal board like Eddie. He's just the best. Uh, I believe he had them modified when when he first had them. He had them so that they had a little bit of boost in them when he kicked them in. So the phase shifter would boost up his sound and stuff, and he wouldn't lose any signal through them. Um, let me give you one more example here. This is the last example we're going to get. Example 51. We're gonna, I'm going to show you what uh, his uh, latest piece of paraphernalia is for his guitar, OK? Here we go. We're going to use a drill for this. We have a cordless drill. This is kind of a cool thing. Check this out. Uh, don't do that with a power drill, man. I put a power drill up there and it's plugged in. It makes some noise. I was scared I was going to get shocked and killed. Uh, the wireless ones are kind of cool. And who's, I don't know, guess we can all go out and buy Makita drills to use as a piece of paraphernalia for our guitar and wear them on our belts and look cool. But uh, it's, it's kind of a neat thing. He's, always, he's in, always inventing. He's like bored all the time. As soon as something's out, he's looking for something new. Uh, the perpetual inventor. Um, I've enjoyed making this tape, and I've enjoyed the, the time we spent doing it, and I hope you got something out of it. Let me uh, let me just try to play like Eddie for a bit and see see what you see what I'm talking about. Okay. See you later.